I, I know that uh, it's, I think the lighting is not super ideal. I'm still going to continue working on the board. So uh, I encourage students especially to move forward if possible. There's a seat over there, I think, probably a seat you know, perhaps over here. So please come forward, and especially those people in the fourth row, if something I'm writing is not clear, please just call out. Can you guys nominally see at least? Everything except for the bottom half of the middle segment. Everything except for the bottom half of the middle segment. <laughs> middle segment. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> all, the, all the results will be there. <laughs> OK. So um, actually, I wanted to start, to be honest, I wanted to start talking about um, avalanches and Griffith's rare region effects in the many body localized phase. Um, as I promised last night, but Dima did such a good job setting up Floquet that I think I'm going to switch the order around. So I'll start talking a little bit about Floquet phases, and uh, my goal is to get through both this and then um, move on to rare region effects in the many body localized phase. But um, if I don't get there, my lecture notes will be online and it, they'll, they'll be there so you can read it. Good. So let's recap a little bit of the setup, the initial story that Dima explained. We'll be following up um, on some of the physics that he explained. And the basic setting that we're going to be considering is that of Floquet phases, uh, where the Hamiltonian is time dependent, but time dependent in a very, very specific and kind of mild way. The Hamiltonian is periodic in time, such that the equations of motion return back to themselves after some big period t. The simplest example that Dima wrote up for this type of physics is that of a stroboscopic drive. Stroboscopic drive. Where one, for example, can simply alternate between two Hamiltonians. Let's say a Hamiltonian H1 for a time T1 and a Hamiltonian H2 for a time T2. As we learned from Dima's talk, the time evolution of a system is governed by the unitary u of t for a single period, which corresponds to e to the minus i h2 t2 e to the minus i h1 t1. And what Dima explained is that there is a systematic way to try to figure out what or whether there exists an effective Hamiltonian that describes these dynamics, where we only look at the dynamics at stroboscopic times. What I mean by stroboscopic times is looking at the system at every period t. Looking at the system in between these periods t is typically known as looking at the micro motion of the system. But most of the time here, we're going to be interested in the stroboscopic evolution of the system. This unitary is the generator of time evolution. And it turns out this general framework applying the general framework of applying sort of periodic of applying periodic excitation or driving to a system. This is going to be re-emphasizing, I think, maybe in a slightly different language than the team explained. The general framework for applying periodic driving to a system to control the system has been around for a long, long period of time. And this is not a recent discovery that one can look at interesting physics or do useful things in the context of periodically driving a quantum mechanical system. And maybe the most classic example where people oftentimes apply periodic driving is in the context of nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Which I'm sure many of you are extremely familiar with. There's techniques that kind of go under the general moniker of dynamical decoupling, where the essence of the technique is precisely applying periodic pulses to a given system. The goal there was to narrow spectroscopic lines in NMR spectra to be able to see certain types of physics more clearly by echoing out inhomogeneities in the system. And this general technique has been along around for at least half a century, if not more. So the question one can ask, and I think maybe the most natural setting one should consider, is why is it exactly that we're considering 
these periodically driven Floquet phases of matter. So why has it become kind of an active research topic in the last couple of years, or the last few years, when this general technique has been around for 50 years or so? And the answer, in kind of a thermodynamic sense, in a really precise theoretical sense, is exactly the intuition that Dima gave, which is that for a strongly interacting many-body system that's being periodically driven, we expect the system to absorb energy. And the intuition for this is really, really simple. You know, what's periodically driving a system, so when shaking the system in some way, One's doing work on the system, and this one expects at some time scale the system is going to absorb energy from this periodic driving field, literally shaking it, you're changing the equations of motion every period t. And as you absorb energy from this, whatever interesting state you had is going to heat up, and whatever interesting order you might have thought you had, one expects perhaps to melt. And in this context, one really expects there not to be very interesting flow K phases of matter, at least in the thermodynamic sense, where we take long times, large system sizes. We can certainly have interesting transient dynamics. But the intuition is that in general, for a many-body system that's periodically driven, it absorbs energy and leads to an infinite temperature state. And as Dima gave you a hint, if we believe that the system satisfies something that looks like thermalization or the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, and if we assume in the simplest case that there are no real symmetries of the Hamiltonians H1 and H2, because it's periodically driven, in fact, energy is not even conserved, then if you remember back to my very first lecture, the reduced density matrix at times goes to infinity <coughs> is simply going to be proportional to the identity. And it's hard to imagine saying that there's any interesting feature that's possibly long-lived in the system if the fate of the reduced density matrix is something that locally looks like an infinite temperature film state. So it turns out there are now a number of strategies to be able to prevent this kind of a trivial fate for a strongly interacting, periodically driven system. A number of strategies to combat this. Dima explained two of those, and I'll also work off of those two strategies. One of the strategies is by using strong disorder. Strong disorder to get a system into a many-body localized flow K regime And the second strategy is perhaps by controlling frequency compared to the local energy scale of the system, one can enter a pre-thermal regime. We'll go through each of these in turn, but the specific context that I'd like to think about Specific context I like to think about in terms of flow K phase of matter is sort of the simplest case of symmetry breaking. The simplest case of symmetry breaking. And what I mean by that is I'd like to look at the breaking if we imagine that there's no internal symmetries of the Hamiltonian, as I promised you then there's only one symmetry that we have in the entire problem, and that's time translation symmetry. Time translation symmetry. Precisely governed by the fact that the equation of motion, the Hamiltonian, comes back to itself every integer period t. So we have, just like, you know, 
In a crystal, for example, we can imagine having spatial translation symmetry, where the Hamiltonian looks like it's invariant under a translation by a lattice spacing. Here, in a periodically driven system or flow case system, the Hamiltonian is invariant by the exact same translation symmetry, but now in time. And that unit of time is given by the period of the Hamiltonian. So what we'd like to imagine, or we'd like to look for in the simplest example of this kind of flow K phase, is we'd like to see whether or not do there exist, there exist stable systems whose observables, observables break time translation symmetry. So, yeah, please. So, there's a question about this observable. Yeah. If you're doing that, let's say, you can find hypothesis to a path of space, then ideally it doesn't look like the observable edge because maybe first you decide to look at a path of space, but the next path of space is just going to be like Yeah, so it depends on what exactly that pipe hole does in the context of, uh, of either commuting or not commuting with the rest of the dynamics of the Hamiltonian. So if you have non-interacting spins and you just do a bunch of pi pulses, then certainly things come back to themselves because there's nothing that doesn't commute with that object in order to sort of absorb energy and spread it out over the many body system. So I think we'll work in that limit for a second and I'll show a slightly more non-trivial limit. So do there exist stable systems where observables break time translation symmetry? And this is the context where we would imagine having um, kind of the simplest example of a flow K phase of matter. And what we're looking for is a system where you make a local measurement. So you're looking at some local operator, and you can imagine looking at that, the behavior of that local operator, or the expectation value of some local operator as a function of time. So what do I mean by breaking the symmetry? If you find that this local operator only comes back to itself, you know, only returns at some integer multiples of the period where these integer multiples are greater than one, that's the context where we mean that we can think about time translation symmetry being broken. It's super simple, right? It's exactly analogous to what you'd imagine for spatial translation symmetry. The intuition is that the equations of motion come back to themselves every single period. If you measure an observable and it only came back to itself every second period, then that observable, and hence the state in which you're measuring that observable, you can think about that as having broken this symmetry, this already discrete symmetry, down to a subgroup which is even more discrete in some sense. Right? That's at least the context where we'd like to think about this. Yeah, please. Could it be incommensurate? Is it something that stops us? Possibly. It's not a case I want to get into in, the, in this context. Uh, people are thinking about incommensurate. Yeah, people are thinking about asking that question. Uh, I don't really actually know whether or not that's even well defined, in my opinion, but people have asked that question. So I want to work through kind of a, maybe the simplest example, a sort of case study. Uh, the Ising model of this type of symmetry breaking in a flow cake phase. And that simplest example is something that somewhat incorrectly, I suspect, but, uh, or I, I believe, but has kind of caught on, is known as a discrete time crystal. So let's work through this example. In particular, we'll derive some properties where we look at a very specific Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian will be given by, in the first period, this is H1, it's a stroboscopic Hamiltonian. The sum over sites i, so the context, again, as we've been doing many, many times, is a one-dimensional chain of spin one-half particles. The first piece of the Hamiltonian is given by the sum over h, sigma xi, and it will be 
as promised, applied for a period of time t1. And the second period of the Hamiltonian will have interactions jzi, sigma zi, sigma zi plus 1. So nearest neighbor Ising interactions plus bzi, sigma zi. So also a random field in the z direction. And this will be applied for a period of time t2. So the first observation one can make is that each of the Hamiltonians individually are integrable. Right? One is just, you know, non-interacting spins in the x direction with a field in the x direction, and the other is everything in the z basis, so I know all the eigenstates are just the various product states along the z direction. But of course, as Dima explained, when you think about the effect of Hamiltonian that describes this physics, and one expands to higher orders, one gets commutators of these two, and the two certainly do not commute with each other, which means that actually, in fact, the effect of Floquet evolution is certainly not going to be integral, despite the fact that the two individual pieces have very, very simple looking structures. Another, a second observation that particularly is particularly important is that note that we have the JZI and the BZI having randomness. So the fact that there's an I index here, the fact that it depends on site I, is an indication that we built in randomness, randomness into the system. And the precise reason we built in randomness into the system is exactly to combat this heating process. So we built in randomness in the system, and the goal is to combat the natural heat absorption from the driving field by working, hopefully, in a regime which is Floquet MDL. This begs an important question, which is whether or not the physics, so in some sense, we think about many-body localization as an intrinsically quantum mechanical effect. And the reason it's intrinsically quantum mechanical is because it really depends on the discreteness of the energy levels of the quantum mechanics. So MBL, you really think of as fundamentally quantum. But at the moment, it seems like the only reason we add in many-body localization or this quantum feature is to prevent heating. There's a, a strategy that allows us to prevent heating of this periodically driven system. And I think there's a, a, a valid open question, which is, are there non-quantum ways to prevent this heating, or are there classical systems, classical systems that show the same type of order same type of time translation symmetry breaking order, but which don't use quantum mechanics or many body localization to get out of this regime of heating. Okay, so that's a question that people are thinking about. What I'd like to prove to you now is basically the claim that this Hamiltonian that all preferable states of this Hamiltonian, of this Floquet system, end up looking like they break time translation symmetry precisely in the sense that local observables will only return to themselves after some period of t. Is the setting clear? Good. So the specific context We'll be thinking about this is a leading order, exactly as was asked by the question over here. We're going to be working in the first case where we think about the field multiplied by the time scale that the first Hamiltonian is applied for, HT1. Note that there's no disorder here, so everything's happening the same for every single spin degree of freedom in the first period of the drive, 
I'm going to choose that to be precisely pi over 2. Set t1, choose the timing of that first piece of my drive to be pi over 2. And this is exactly what was asked earlier uh, and in the context of NMR or cold atoms, people do spin echo, it's known as a pi pulse. And this pi pulse serves to do the following every spin. It takes spin down to spin up, and spin up to spin down, where up and down can quantize in the z direction at the moment. So the first study, the first case one can consider is the case where the interactions are strictly zero. And in that case, if we take, if we start with an initial state that looks like some random product state in the z basis of our n spins, the first piece of the time evolution is simply going to flip every single spin. So the first piece of the time evolution, the T1 piece, will flip every spin. The second piece of the time evolution, in the case where J is zero, won't really do anything, it's just an accumulation of phase. Because the spins are still eigenstates in the Z basis, just a magnetic field pointing in some direction. So the second piece of the evolution doesn't change the orientation of the spins. And this means, uh, let me emphasize for one quick second, that the overall period, of course, for the Hamiltonian is given by the sum of T1 and T2. I guess that was apparent, but I should say it. So in fact, if one looks at a local observable, perhaps the simplest local observable one would hope to look at is sigma z on a particular site at a given time. Again, I promised that we would look at things stroboscopically. And the point is that we start off, let's say the spin is in spin up, so at time t equals zero for the zero stroboscopic cycle, sigma z is plus one. At the next cycle, after a unit of t1 and t2, then sigma z will be minus one. And then sigma z will be plus one, and then sigma z will be minus one. And it looks like, in a super, super trivial way, in a set of non interacting spins, it looks like naively we've satisfied this definition of time translation symmetry breaking. Some local observable on a system with a naturally prepared initial state in this flow k context looks like. Its observable only comes back to itself some, in this case, period doubled fashion, whereas the equations of motion are periodic with time period t. The key essence here is, of course, that in the absence of interactions, it turns out I am writing down the most important thing at the bottom of this, so I'll, I'll, I'll say it out loud, and if it's unclear, you can call out. In the absence of interactions, j equals zero, it turns out this behavior is fundamentally not stable. And what we require, following up on John, I guess he's already left for the airport, maybe one of the crucial things that we require really to define a phase of matter is some notion of rigidity, where the phase of matter should be stable to perturbations of the initial state and also stable to perturbations of the equations of motion. And it turns out, for example, this instability is immediately evident if we change, for example, this ht1 to be something that's different from pi over 2. So if we imagine adding on some error to this, then it turns out every single spin will be imperfectly rotated. Well, then Lorimer process in the second, in the second step of evolution around the local magnetic field, 
and then they'll come back to themselves, but imperfectly again, you'll flip to some other different direction after long processing, and you'll no longer see this behavior at all. For single spins, you'll start seeing some decay of this oscillation, and then actually, because there's only a very, very small Hilbert space, it turns out afterwards you'll see beating of this behavior. But the important feature is that if we think about there being an order parameter for this particular phase, for this particular flow k phase, and that order parameter is really something that looks like the Fourier transform of this time trace, then what we expect is the following. If we think about something that's easy to see the order parameter for this, we can imagine taking the Fourier transform of the time trace of a local spin evaluated at stroboscopic times capital T, 2T, 3T, etc. And what you expect to see is that the amplitude of the Fourier transform as a function of the frequency of the system in the ideal case where epsilon is equal to zero, you expect to see period double behavior, which means that in the frequency response, there should be a peak, a quote unquote subharmonic piece. This omega over two precisely comes from the fact that the actual time dynamics are doubled, which means the system is really responding at a frequency omega that's half the driving frequency. And it turns out, for any finite epsilon, this behavior is broken. For any finite epsilon, no matter how small, you basically see that whatever our original peak was, will become split in some way and no longer rigidly set at omega over 2. And the claim slash question now is to ask ourselves, what happens if one turns on interactions? What happens in the presence of finite J? And the hope for this particular, the hope for this particular phase and this particular type of symmetry breaking is that when one turns on finite interaction strength, that now this behavior or the order parameter associated with the subharmonic frequency response is really now going to be truly stable to some finite perturbation epsilon. Of course, if you keep increasing epsilon, as you naturally have for any phase of matter, you can get out of that phase. But you would like to be there to be some finite value that is system size independent, with which the system now stays remains rigid when one has finite interaction strength. And in this context, that's what people mean when they say that interactions can endow the system with rigidity. There was a question back there. Yeah. yeah, please. I mean, what's the problem with not being, with the other parameter not being exactly at omega over 2? It still, in a sense, breaks time reversals, time simulation on symmetry. There's just no, I mean, there's just no notion of stability. I mean, so it is, you know, in a situation where, um, in a situation where you have uh, a peak that looks like this, you know, any perturbation, any jiggle to your system means that this frequency is just going to move around. If you change the perturbation some finite amount, it's going to move around. And you don't expect to say, like, you know, if you have a phase of matter that's, like, a solid. You don't expect there to say, like, you know, any fluctuation is going to change this to be a different phase of matter. It would look like it has a different order parameter. So it's not really thinking about, you don't want to think about saying this, oh, this is something less than one. But you want to say this is something perhaps less than one, but also has to be stable to perturbations. That's really the important thing. Because I mean, in a crystal, if you change the pressure, it's going to change you know, the lattice size. Yeah. yeah, OK. So this is like a small perturbation that changes the period at which it comes back. But... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's a, I, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with that analogy. So I mean, changing the pressure is changing something extensive, but then the Hamiltonian itself actually still translation invariant. And the thing that happens for that crystal is now symmetry breaking with respect to the fact that the Hamiltonian has some continuous time translation symmetry. 
but you've now written down a totally different Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Good, 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 good. Yesterday, I think you said that's also an interaction free when you convert it. Sorry, if you change that, so my initial Hamiltonian I wrote down was basically Cz plus some field on Z. And then now this Z that this converts to this like this unit interaction that you should be capable of like it as it's working. Sure, sure, sure. Is it, do you get the same result if you can Yeah, it doesn't matter actually. So as long as there's interactions here, we have to be a little bit careful to break symmetries in the problem, but that it doesn't matter what type of interaction one has here. Okay, so let me make a claim. And the claim is going to be to try to understand what exactly the Floquet eigenstates are. What exactly do the Floquet eigenstates look at, look like with non-zero J? And my claim is that the Floquet eigenstates will come in pairs which I index as psi plus minus. And they'll look like e to the minus i epsilon naught over 2. I haven't told you what epsilon naught is yet. An example is all spins down, plus or minus e to the plus i epsilon naught over 2, all spins up. Okay. And my claim is that Every single eigenstate of the Floquet unitary will come in this form. And I've chosen a specific example. They will all be cat states. But I've chosen a specific example of all down plus all up. But you can choose any arrangement, for example, that arrangement. And the corresponding object that lives inside the cat state is the all flip version of that object. Okay. This claims that all eigenstates of this unitary look like this. And in particular, we're going to define epsilon naught as the sum over i bzi multiplied by time scale t2. So let's go through this explicitly to show that indeed these are what the Floquet eigenstates look like. To do this, let's first look at what the unitary for the first period acting on our claimed eigenstates are. And again, we're going to work now in the limit where epsilon is equal to zero, so we have perfect pi pulses. So when u1 acts on psi plus minus, what's going to happen is that the phase factors in front are not going to change. The only thing that's going to change is that every single spin will be flipped to its opposite direction because we have a pi pulse. Right? So this will now look like e to the minus i epsilon naught over 2. The first term will all spins up, plus minus e to the i epsilon naught over 2, all spins down. Super simple. And now let's apply the second piece of the unitary. And if the claim is that we're going to get back a Floquet eigenstate of this, we better get this proportional back to psi plus minus itself with a coefficient that's the corresponding Floquet eigenvalue. That's what we'd like to see. The second piece, of course, has everything in the z basis. And it turns out we had have, we have nearest neighbor sigma z, sigma z interactions. And those nearest neighbor sigma z, sigma z interactions don't care whether or not all my spins are flipped or not flipped. They're invariant under a pi rotation because spins only see their relative orientation of their neighbor. So if I flip both spins, the relative orientation of that neighboring pair is still the same. So that gives me the same energy. So the energy associated with the interaction Jzi, sigma Zi, sigma Zi plus 1 just leads to an overall phase factor e to the i phi in front of the entire term. Because it acts on both of these two states in the exact same way. But now, it turns out I've chosen this value of epsilon on the specific phase factor over here to be very specific, bzi t2. So each of these states will now pick up a different energy, epsilon naught. And in particular, all of the spin-ups will pick up, for example, epsilon naught 
uh, the positive version of epsilon naught, and all spin downs, because you have a sigma z matrix over here, will pick up the negative sign. So actually, the spin ups will have an additional term coming from the magnetic field component that looks like a phase e to the i epsilon naught. And the spin down terms will have an additional phase that looks like e to the minus i epsilon naught. And this comes from the longitudinal field that we had in H2. So we have the minus i epsilon naught over 2 plus the i epsilon naught. So actually, the first term now looks like e to the i epsilon naught over 2. So you can see we carefully chose that phase such that in the second piece of the evolution, it basically just flips sign. And of course, because we are in the z basis, nothing about the state itself changes. And now we have, again, plus minus e to the minus i epsilon naught over 2. And nothing about this state changes again. And you can already see, comparing with the state that we wrote up over there, that this is precisely plus minus e to the i phi psi plus minus. So the claim is true. All of the flow k eigenstates of this problem look like cat states of superpositions of two states in the z basis, which correspond to exact pi flips of each other. And this leads to a crucial fact. The crucial consequence of this is that any state that we can prepare, any preparable state, so as we take larger and larger systems or we're thinking about a thermodynamic limit, it becomes impossible in any meaningful way to prepare these macroscopic cat states. We're interested in the dynamics of states that we can prepare. Any state that we can prepare must be the linear combination of two of these flow k eigenstates. So in particular, exactly in the same way that psi plus one of the flow k eigenstates is a linear combination of the two cat states, any one of these two states is going to be a linear combination of psi plus and psi minus. Any of these two, if you wanted to, to get this term, you need to add psi plus and psi minus. Adding psi plus and psi minus will kill off the second piece. So any preparable initial state, so z basis state, must be a linear combination of two of these flow k eigenstates. And crucially, the energy of these flow k eigenstates, so you'll have a preparable state psi p being, for example, a linear combination of psi plus and psi minus. But of course, these two states differ in energy from each other by pi, there's a factor of minus 1 between the energy of these two states, which means that under a single period of evolution t, the eigenstate actually will go to something that looks like psi plus minus psi minus, coming from the pi quasi-energy difference of these two flow k eigenstates, it's from the pi quasi-energy difference. And thus, will only come back to itself after two periods of evolution. So this is, yeah, please. Are these the only stable eigenstates uh, under this quantity? These are the only, these are, these are the eigenstates. I, I, I don't know what, uh, what stable eigenstates mean. These are, I constructed all two to the end eigenstates, they all of them. I mean, I mean, this is one I mean, this is one pair of eigenstates, but you can literally take any spin configuration, you know, pick a z basis spin configuration, and there's another set of flow key eigenstates that correspond to the same epsilon over two, but now it's bzi evaluated in that state, and the flip of the state is a thing that's superposed.
So it turns out the consequence of this is actually exactly the same. Basically, we'll draw the same picture over here as a function of stroboscopic times, 0, t, 2t, 3t, etc. If we look at the local expectation value of a single spin, sigma z i of t, we find that it oscillates back But the key is that, now unlike the previous case, these oscillations are not simply Robbie oscillations. They're not just Robbie oscillations. So in the previous non-interacting case, you can really think about simple pi pulse driven spins that are simply Robbie oscillating back and forth. These are not just Robbie oscillations. And the fact that emphasizes that they're not just Robbie oscillations is the fact that, in fact, this behavior is now stable to finite perturbations, to perturbations, um, aka things like uh, pulse imperfections. Imperfections or finite epsilon. So what this means is that now, unlike the previous case, if we look at the Fourier transform of the z-magnetization of a single spin, we'll find that in fact, you'll have the same response in the absence of finite epsilon. So for epsilon equals zero, in fact, the non-interacting and interacting cases look absolutely identical. But when one does add in perturbations, it turns out this peak is locked at frequency omega over two for finite epsilon before, at large enough epsilon, we have a change in that behavior. Is it clear? Yeah, thanks. Um, wait, what, what parameter is epsilon referring to a change in? Uh, epsilon is referring to a change, sorry. So it, I wrote h t1 equals pi over 2 plus epsilon. So that's the epsilon. It's a change in basically the angle of the pulse that I'm rotating by. In the trivial case, you know, you're trying to get some two-fold behavior. So in the trivial case, you're just doing a perfect flip. But now the claim is actually, in the presence of interactions, actually, this subharmonic response is stable to imperfections in this pulse, despite the fact that nominally every single spin is getting flipped incorrectly. What, is there an easy way to see that? Uh, no, <laughs> there isn't. So, I mean, it's not, in some sense, uh, the stability of this is not really proved. It's, very, very hard to prove this. There's no formal proof that this is true, but numerically we can see that in fact it's stable to some finite perturbation. And that stability is exactly the sense of rigidity that I was trying to emphasize is kind of characteristic of what we want for a phase of matter. A couple of comments. First, again, let me emphasize this one more time. In the most ideal situation, to sort of really cleanly say that we have a discrete time crystal, we'd like to have all other symmetries being broken. Symmetries being broken. So it turns out there's a large class of things which are currently being called time crystals, which would not satisfy this notion of time crystal in order in my opinion, because it turns out that the time translation symmetry breaking can depend on another symmetry being broken. And in some sense, time translation symmetry breaking is then just piggybacking off the symmetry breaking of another symmetry in the problem. So it's possible that you could have time translation symmetry breaking um, dependent on another symmetry being broken. 
another symmetry being broken. <coughs> so in the ideal case, you'd like to have models where the only symmetry for the problem is time translation symmetry. Again, the important feature that I'm emphasizing here is that it's really the interactions that have led to this rigidity of the subharmonic response. In the absence of interactions, we had a response that was not stable to arbitrarily small perturbations of the driving sequence. And perhaps the most important final point is that we'd like to have in such a phase, a notion of long-range order, and it turns out that this long-range order will have both space and time in it. <coughs> so people typically call this long-range spatio-temporal order. And the idea is that if you look at a correlation function between two spins, sigma z i of t, sigma z j of zero, and you look at the distance i minus j getting very large, and also the limit where time is very long. So we're taking a thermodynamic limit, the limit as t goes to infinity, the limit as the norm of i minus j goes to infinity. So long times, long distances, a two-point correlation function sigma z i of t, sigma z j of zero. We say that the system exhibits long-range spatial-temporal order if this goes to some value and doesn't simply decay to zero as one takes the thermodynamic limit. This is exactly the notion that in the thermodynamic limit, thermodynamic limit, there is a well-defined notion of a rigid order in the system. So let's write down now, let's draw out maybe the kind of canonical phase diagram, phase diagram, not just for the time crystal, but really kind of for any floquet phase of matter. And the two axes that we're going to have, we can think about there being an interaction strength. Remember that in the absence of interactions, one doesn't expect any notion of a thermodynamic limit. There's no notion of a many-body stability. And at least in the case of the time crystal, let's imagine there's some other parameter that controls the nature of the symmetry breaking. So it turns out, in this context, one's naturally squeezed in Floquet phases between two walls. In the small j limit, if your interactions are extremely weak, that it turns out you should expect that you could only tolerate very small amounts of epsilon. But it turns out that if you have interactions that are extremely strong, if you remember thinking about many-body localization lecture I gave last night, we thought about proving the stability of many-body localization starting from an Anderson insulator, which was not interacting. And we said that if you add in interactions that are perturbative, it's possible that this Anderson insulator remains stable. And if it does remain stable, that's exactly what the many-body localized phase is. But that also gives you the perspective that if you make interactions very, very strong, you should expect there to be more and more thermalization. So larger interactions you expect to lead you to an ETH phase. So in general, one expects, maybe in the simplest schematic way, that there exists a critical value of the interaction strengths beyond which things simply thermalize and end up being floquet ETH states, or with rho, for example, proportional to the identity. In the limit where the interaction is finite, but small enough such that we don't violate many-body localization, so this is always in the disordered context, you can imagine that now, for some small, for large enough epsilon, so if we're thinking about taking a cut in vertical space for some finite j before things thermalize, so in the many-body localized phase, 
this entire object over here is the MBL regime. Then what one expects to have is that, as promised, at some critical value of this perturbation or finite pulse imperfections, one expects that one's now in the non-time crystalline or trivial phase. So this is a phase that satisfies the time translation symmetry of the equations of motion. And for small enough epsilon c over here, this would be the discrete time crystal. Good. Since it turns out now that there's many, many experimental systems that are claiming to see time crystal order, and uh, I would say none of them have actually seen time crystal order, so let me give a little update on what I mean by that, and very, very quickly comment on the status of experiments, because I think that's maybe one of the most active directions that people are trying to explore. So the experiments can maybe be broken down into a couple of categories. So there are trapped atomic ion experiments, mainly done, at least in this context, by the group of Christopher Monroe at the University of Maryland. There are experiments on NB centers in diamond, a collaboration between Eugene's group and Misha's group at Harvard. There are experiments on um, classic and a classic kind of NMR experiment think on ammonium dihydrophosphate. These are experiments done in Sean Barrett's group at Yale. And there are a number of other experiments that are kind of similarly in an NMR context, small molecule NMR, um, and also phosphorus. Uh, dose silicon, but I think we can kind of group those maybe in one category of NMR. So I'd like to make three rows in terms of the number of spins or the number of particles that kind of exist in the system, whether or not there exists disorder in the problem, and whether or not or in what context should we think about this as a time crystal. In the trapped ion systems, it turns out they have a very, very small number of degrees of freedom. They have 14 trapped ions in a row. That's hardly the thermodynamic limit for showing some type of many-body rigidity. They have disorder in the problem that's really built in and programmed in. So each of the Zeeman splittings of the ions has a different value controlled by a laser beam. And the understanding is that the hope is that, you know, although it's, I think, hard to claim this given that there's such a small number of systems, but the Hamiltonian that they have, looking at numerics, is consistent, although I think not definitive, it's, maybe there is, it's not inconsistent with being in a many-body localized discrete time crystal phase. NB centers in diamond, there's many, many, many degrees of freedom. So let's say 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 degrees of freedom in the system. There's also disorder, quite strong disorder in the model, coming from the existence of many different paramagnetic impurities, and also coming from the fact that spatially, all of the NB centers are sitting at random locations within the diamond lattice. But it turns out that one doesn't expect, because of the long-range interactions that exist in the system, and the fact that they're in three dimension, it turns out one probably doesn't expect there to be many body localization in the system. But I would say, arguably, they see actually a cleaner version of a signal than was originally seen in the trapped ion experiments. But we do not believe it's either a many body localized time crystal, or the other context that I'll say in just one second, we also don't believe it's a pre-thermal time crystal. And in fact, we, people have analyzed 
The reason why we can still see the same type of behavior in local observables, and it kind of now has gone under the moniker of a critical time crystal, where Dima's group has been doing a lot of really nice theory to understand that. But the essence of the control of the heating is really that the thermalization of the system is slow. And it's parametrically slower than the exponential that one would typically affect in most systems. In fact, one kind of expects in disordered one over r cubed systems in 3D that the thermalization, although it does happen, proceeds as a power law instead of at some exponential. So critical time crystal, and the key is that thermalization proceeds as some power law. In the context of NMR physics, again, there's many, many degrees of freedom. There's no disorder, basically no disorder, in these models that people are considering with respect to a ammonium dihydrate phosphate, sort of an order lattice of nuclear spins within this particular uh, sample. So again, in the absence of disorder, one doesn't expect it to be a many-body localized time crystal table it for one second, but because the initial states are very, very high temperature, one doesn't expect it to be a pre-thermal time crystal. And actually, it's not super clear whether or not the sort of dynamics of the system are governed by this critical regime because of the absence of disorder. There is some slow thermalization that happens. Slow thermalization that happens and during the period of that slow thermalization, one can again see dynamics that look like what would be sort of transient local observables that look like this signal. But eventually, we expect, at least for both of these experiments, we expect it to decay to zero. But in some sense, this goes back to the question that we had in the very, very beginning. Does it really matter that it ends up going to zero? Fine, in a precise theoretical sense, it does. But if it's not really accessible on experimental time scales, it's very, very hard to say that you know, we're not observing the same type of phenomenology, although maybe in a precise sense, one doesn't expect theoretical stability up to infinite times. Good. So since we've been talking about... So is it the thermal time crystal? No. So, it's, uh, so uh, Willing, it's a very good question. So now we'll ask ourselves the question perfect. Beautiful. That was just asked over here, is it a pre-thermal time crystal? To answer that, we have to first ask, what is a pre-thermal time crystal? And I'll explain that in the context, again, of looking at some local observable where now we imagine, for example, unlike the Hamiltonian that I wrote up initially, we imagine that there's no disorder, but rather that we have a frequency that's large compared to the local energy scale of the problem. Okay. So we've modified our original Hamiltonian to take out the disorder. So we're not trying to many-body localize it, but we're trying to control the rate of the heating using the frequency of the drive relative to the local energy scale. Where yeah. did we use this order in our previous stream? Sorry? Like when you were talking about the time crystal, you never really actually used the fact that the thing was disordered. Yeah, that's, that's good. So let me let me go back to that point again. Okay. So that's that's a, a extremely, extremely important. So remember, the only place where there was disorder was in the fact that the Hamiltonian basically looks like I ended up saying that there was each of these coefficients, the JZIs and the BZIs, are chosen from a random distribution. So there was definitely disorder built into my Hamiltonian. But you should ask yourself, where exactly did this disorder show up? The disorder showed up precisely in the fact that there is a finite value of the interaction strength where the system is MPL. In the absence of disorder, this entire regime of many-body localization doesn't exist. And thus, you basically always have flow K ETH states that end up at late times looking like the thermal state. And so the only place that, sorry? 
Uh, apart from epsilon equals zero, or? Apart from epsilon equals zero. Yeah. Apart from epsilon is equal to zero, that's an integrable point where the spins just never talk to each other. That's, that's, it's kind of like the, uh, you, know, you know, disorder equals zero. But the only place where disorder entered is really as a strategy to control heating and to have a well-defined notion in the phase diagram of an MPL regime. Yeah, please. In the phase diagram, why is it that line in the middle straight? Yeah, it's not straight, sorry, it's, it's schematic. No, no, all of this will be curved. Actually, the phase diagram, realistically, looks something maybe a little bit more like this. So, yeah, absolutely. I didn't mean for it to, yeah, sorry about that. I should have said that that was a very schematic thing. Good, so let's look at two observables on this plot. Uh, in particular, let's look at the first observable is something that Dima kind of already showed us. Let's imagine measuring the local energy density as a function of time. Let's imagine the first thing we do is the same exact Hamiltonian no disorder, frequency is large, and we'll have this scale, the y-axis on a linear scale, and let's imagine that the x-axis is on a logarithmic scale. So what Dean and company were able to prove in a really, really gorgeous result is that if you start with some finite energy density for your state, that in fact, this doesn't really appreciably change and heat up until some time scale, t star, that scales exponentially in the frequency over the local energy scale. Okay. And so what one expects, actually, in terms of this pre-thermal description, is, um, okay, so instead of plotting things sort of, you know, in the zigzag pattern, let's just multiply every second period by negative one, so that we can plot things on a straight line without having to go up and down. And what you expect now is in the pre-thermal regime that Dima explained, you expect maybe there would be some initial decay, but now the time crystal's order parameter remains stable for some exponentially long time, and it's precisely cut off by the time scale associated with the heating. And in the trivial phase, where one doesn't have time crystal order, where, for example, epsilon is too large, then one rather expects that, in fact, the thermalization it will still thermalize, but in fact now, there will be no intermediate time plateau, and it is this intermediate time plateau, <coughs> so-called pre-thermal plateau, where people say that there is effectively a pre-thermal time crystal order. So this would be if you had, if you were not in the time crystal phase, if you were in the trivial phase, you'd see that things thermalize, and on a time scale well before absorption of energy in the problem, you already have no order parameter. In the pre-thermal case, where you are in the time crystal phase, you'll thermalize to a finite value of that order parameter for an exponentially long time, controlled by the eventual heating of the system to infinite temperature. I would say that this has not been observed yet in experiments. And in particular, let me emphasize the differences between a many-body localized and a pre-thermal time crystal. The first key thing to emphasize is that in the pre-thermal context, the ordering the time crystal depends on ordering of the effective Hamiltonian. I don't remember, is this what notation you use? D effective, Dima, or something else? Okay, but so this is basically the order, this is the, in, the time, the Hamiltonian that describes the intermediate dynamics in the plateau regime, whatever Dima called it, we're gonna call it D effective over here. The pre-thermal time crystal depends on the ordering of this D effective. That means that, and this is very important, one only expects to see time crystalline behavior for states that are low energy with 
respect to D effective. Okay. So in the many body localized context, in the many body localized context, barring the comments that we've had in theory, it turns out you can imagine that the entire spectrum, if it was many body localized, that every single state would exhibit the same type of order. But as Dima described to you, it turns out the dynamics of this prethermal plateau are well described by an effective Hamiltonian. Sorry, uh, if something's unclear, just yell out. Um, are well described by an effective Hamiltonian, and seeing this flow k order, this flow k phase, depends on ordering of this Hamiltonian, which means that we have to be in states which are low energy with respect to d effective. So unlike the many-body localized case, it turns out one expects that only a subset of states to really satisfy this behavior and look like this. So for example, in the many-body localized case where every single state is localized, no matter what initial state you see, you'll see this order parameter survive. In the pre-thermal context, depending on the energy density of the state, you'll see sometimes that it looks like this, and other times that it looks like the trivial things. So in the trivial, in the, in the tuning of seeing this behavior, usually we just talk about tuning this perturbation parameter. But in the pre-thermal Hamiltonian or the pre-thermal case, you can also tune the energy density of the initial state to see that transition. There was a question over there. Yeah? Just one step back. The difference between a pre-thermal time crystal and a critical one is that instead of having an exponentially long pre-thermalization like time scale, you have a power law. OK, you know, good question. Good question. So. Uh, yes and no. Actually, really no and no. So <laughs> it turns out that uh, the first thing we'll say is that you know there's no really well-defined time scale. There's no parametric time scale in the case of the power law. Here, there's really a parametric time scale which you can make arbitrarily long by changing the ratio of omega over j. And there's no there's no notion of that control. You don't get to parametrically control that time scale and make it more stable. And the second thing is that the reason why these two experiments, answering both your questions together, are not, cannot be thought of in any way as pre-thermal time crystals, is that the effective state that they start out with is basically infinite temperature. So what they do in those experiments is they optically pump all of the energy centers to one state. But it turns out that state, with respect to the dipole-dipole Hamiltonian in 3D, is effectively infinite temperature. So in no sense is the initial state they start with at a low temperature, so it can't be that. But it doesn't mean, I want to emphasize this, it doesn't mean that it's not interesting. It means that actually there's another kind of slow dynamics that happens in terms of this critical thermalization, for example. But it, means, but it does mean that there's no parametric time scale, and it cannot be thought of as pre-thermal because the state is too hot initially. So you just get what you, like the time scale in which this state exists, you just get what you get based on like what Exactly. You, you, you basically get what you get based on the time scale that the system thermalizes. But there is a difference between things that don't thermalize like this. Typically, you know, you thermalize much faster than that. But here, there's kind of a slow power law approach. And within that power law approach, you can absolutely see the same behavior that people observe. Good. So we've emphasized this already, but I'll write it down again. It does not survive truly to t goes to infinity. To get there, you have to many body localize the system. And another difference, which kind of maybe is a, gives you a more, a more striking context, is that there does not exist a pre thermal time crystal in 1D. In 1D. So everything I've been talking about in the context of the model for time crystals has been, in the disordered model for time crystals, has been in a one-dimensional system. But now the crucial fact is that in order for there to be a pre-thermal time crystal, I have to order with respect to an effective Hamiltonian that lives in this intermediate plateau regime. And that ordering corresponds to Ising symmetry breaking. And that symmetry breaking has a lower dimension, lower critical dimension of two. So at least for short range interactions, one cannot have a pre-thermal time crystal in 1D, whereas for a many body localized time crystal, that's kind of perhaps the only place one can have an MBL time crystal, depending on whether or not um, many body localization is truly stable in higher dimensions. So let me just end with kind of a, 
maybe a, a zoology on time crystal. Sorry, I know I'm a little bit over time. So let's ask ourselves, what is kind of the framework for time crystals? And how do we think about this? And what, in a different context, with and without disorder, you can follow a very natural little flow chart. Start by asking the question, is there disorder? In the case where there is disorder, we can ask ourselves, I've sort of already alluded to this fact, that for short-range interactions, there is no pre-thermal time crystal in 1D. So let's break down both of these pieces of the tree by looking at short and long-range interactions. So for short-range interactions. So if you have strong enough disorder, the yes category, and you have short-range interactions in the problem, you can have an M, a many-body localized time crystal in dimensions 1, 2, and 3 with a time scale that goes to infinity. And let's put a star next to 1, 2, and 3, where the star is that 2 and 3 depends on the existence of MBL in those dimensions. Perhaps unknown, not fully settled. In the case of long-range interactions, the story is kind of similar, that you can expect to have a many-body localized time crystal, but now there's an even stronger obstruction to many-body localization, and that obstruction is that if you have a long-range interaction with a power law falling off as 1 over r to the alpha, that it's possible that many-body localization is only stable for alphas above some number multiplied by the dimension of the system. So again, it's a question of in what context does your long-range interaction stabilize, uh, is, does your long-range interaction allow for a many-body localized phase? So in this context, I would say, strictly speaking, long-range interactions only hurt you. Short-range interactions allow you to have a many-body localized time crystal for sure in one dimension. and two and three dimension, there are arguments about stability of MDL. Long-range is also fine, but it strictly hurts you in the context that it tries to delocalize you and thermalize you. In the no category, so this is the MDL direction. In the no category, we can again ask the same question. And now, this we can think about as the pre-thermal branch. For short-range interactions, for short-range interactions, we can have another subcase. For short-range interactions in 1D, there is none, no time crystal. Exactly because we cannot have symmetry breaking of the pre-thermal effect of Hamiltonian in dimensions greater than two, so for dimensions D greater than or equal to 2, absolutely. One can have a pre-thermal time crystal for short-range interactions in dimension greater than 2. For long-range interactions, this is only going to be, we'll just have one category over here. For long-range interactions in dimension greater than or equal to 2, no problem. But now, a key difference, it turns out, is the fact that in one dimension, in fact, if you have power laws that are between 2 and 1, you can actually order, you can get Z2 symmetry breaking, Ising symmetry breaking at finite temperature for long enough range interactions. And this now lifts you to have a 1D pre-thermal time crystal with long range interactions. So on the disordered side, the many-body localized side, long-range interactions strictly destroy or hurt the ability to localize. In the non-disordered pre-thermal case, long-range interactions can help in the 1D case because they allow for symmetry breaking D effective such that you can have a 1D pre-thermal time crystal, but only in the presence of long-range interactions. Sorry, yeah, I'm so sorry. Okay. So, uh, yeah, with that, let me let me stop here. I, I unfortunately I didn't get 
to the um, to any of the rare region stuff, but again, you can see those in my lecture notes, and feel free to email, and I'm happy to explain stuff in the lecture notes. Thanks a lot.